the three things people get wrong when they give a lecture. They overestimate how much content they can put in. They underestimate how distractible their audiences are. And they don't understand that giving a lecture is really about storytelling. So the three things to remember is less is more. It's all about engaging and telling a story. My name is Carlos Hoyos. I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist and I have been teaching medical students and giving lectures for the last 30 years or so. And the reason why I am here doing this is because ever since in 2016 I was voted by the students most engaging lecture in the medical school, I have been asked to give lectures on how to give lectures. And I've given plenty of those and I thought I'd try something new and make a recording instead. What I'm going to try to summarise is what I think makes an engaging lecture and my experience of doing this over the few years. This is not how it should be done. These are my thoughts about it and I hope they help you. So what makes a lecture a lecture as opposed to stand-up comedian or a political rally or a religious sermon is that uh, like in all those things uh, you stand in front of an audience who are listening to you but unlike all of those other things, you have a curricular point that you need to put across. You need to communicate something that you want the audience to learn. That's what sets it apart from other types of performance. So because a lecture is about conveying, communicating um, a, a curricular item, something you want people to learn, it is very important that before you do anything else, you work out how much content you can put across in the time that you have. And most people overestimate how much they can fit in. Um, I, let me give you an example. If you have 10 minutes to do a presentation and you need one or two minutes at the beginning to set the mood and introduce yourself, and you need two minutes at the end to sum up and give the take home messages, that leaves you eight minutes in which to put your points across. If you are going to uh, spend three minutes for each point, you can barely present three different ideas. And you need to be aware of, those, of that when you plan your lecture. It is very important that you're disciplined about this, both when you're planning the lecture and when you're delivering the lecture. You need to stick to the points you want people to learn and you need to design the whole time around those points being made again and again. And the most important thing, you need to be able to sum up what you want people to remember in the last minute or 30 seconds of the lecture, because that is what people will remember. And when you do that, people need to understand that those are the things that they're supposed to learn and nothing else. So remember, less is more, both when you're planning and when you're delivering. So don't put too much in the lecture when you're planning and don't give too much once you get going. Don't get distracted and sidelined. The second important thing to understand about lectures is to understand that people are very distractible. Giving a lecture is all about drawing attention to yourself and holding that attention for the time that you are communicating. Most people think giving a lecture is all about telling people what you want them to understand, but it is not. It is about people listening to what you're going to tell them. So a lot of energy needs to be dedicated to understand how interaction, visuals and the managing of emotions contribute to people paying attention to you. And I'm going to elaborate those three points. Of course, there are many more, but these are the ones I'm going to focus on. So let me tell you what I mean by this. Take the first minute of the lecture. You might think it's all about starting to tell them what you want to tell them, but actually in the first minute of the lecture you are managing people's expectations and emotions. And there's a certain number of things that need to happen in those first seconds of the lecture which are really important. First of all, you need to introduce yourself. You need to convince the audience that the subject you're going to tell them about is really important and is worth their time. And you also need to convince them that you are the best person to tell them about that. So you need to credential yourself and you need to gather interest in the subject or convey why the subject is important so that people pay attention to you. The next thing you are doing in the first few minutes of the lectures is setting up the mood, the tone of voice, um, the way you look, 
the way you've set up the lecture uh, say, says very much about you and about what's going to follow. But there is more that you need to convey during those first seconds. You need to find a way to convey to the audience that um, it is safe to be in this room and that you really care about them. And there are certain ways to do this, which I'll tell about later. So the first minute is so important that often when I'm given an important lecture, I will memorize word by word the first three or four paragraphs that I'm going to say, because that first impression and all the tasks that need to happen is really important. The second aspect, which is quite important when it comes to drawing attention to you, is the idea of interaction with the audience. You are there performing for them, and this is about communication, it's not one direction, it's in two directions. And it starts when you're preparing the lecture. You need to be able to imagine your audience when you're preparing it, and you need to know as much as you can before you start putting pen to paper what you're going to tell them. You need to understand what people need to know. You need to understand what they already know. And those things are already interaction, even though you haven't met them. But you need to understand that that is crucial to then having their attention. And, and then it comes to interacting with the audience whilst performing. And the I've got four or five tips about this. The first one is quite important, is that you need to make explicit what type of interaction you expect from them and they can expect from you. So you might start by saying, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me, or please don't interrupt me, I will do questions and answers at the end. But uh, you negotiate with the audience what kind of interaction is acceptable and that makes people feel a lot safer. The second point, which is quite important in interaction, is when you ask questions to the audience and you expect an answer. There's two rules for this. The first one is, whenever you ask a question of an audience and you're expecting an answer to come to you, um, you are stuck with waiting for an answer. If you ask a question of the audience and nobody answers and you move on, nobody's going to ever answer any more questions you do. So I would recommend that when you ask questions from the audience, you think them through because they need to be questions people can answer. Uh, many questions are rhetorical and what you're really asking is, what do you think I'm going to tell you next? And those are questions that don't help at all. So think what questions you're going to ask the audience and wait for them to give you an answer. And then the second rule is, when the audience gives you, somebody in the audience gives you an answer, that person needs to feel really good about answering your question, even if what they tell you is not useful at all. The person who answers your question needs to feel good about having answered your question, even if it's not the answer you were looking for. So you need to find a way to find something interesting and valuable in the answer they've given you and make it explicit. If somebody answers you, and they have the feeling they've given you the wrong answer, they will never answer a question again, but probably nobody else in the audience will do that again. So those are the two golden rules. If you ask a question, you need to get an answer. And if somebody answers, you need to make them feel good about having answered. The other form of interaction, which is very common, is when somebody in the audience asks a question of you. Yes. Um, so I don't have many rules about it, but there are two or three things that are important. When somebody in the audience asks you a question, it is important that you acknowledge the question and that you paraphrase the question and uh, uh, say it out, out loud for everybody to hear if you're going to answer it. Then you need to answer it and after you've answered it, it is important to check with whoever asked the question that that answer is satisfactory to them. If you follow this, people are more encouraged to ask more questions. The other common way to interact with an audience is to give audience tasks. For instance, um, turn to the person to your right or to your left and discuss this point I've just made and see if you can find an example. Yes. Uh, you're asking the audience to do things that will help you in your lecture. This is an effective way of interacting with the audience, but it is deceptively simple. Um, most people who give tasks give them in a vague way 
and people don't quite understand what they're supposed to do and that time is wasted. Um, whenever you are going to ask a task, you're going to ask the audience to do something, make sure you have scripted how you're going to give that instruction because um, this needs to be as precise as possible if you want the task to work. The third bit, which is important to uh, keep people attention, is the use of visuals. Um, this is a, a, a big topic. Um, uh, I have had people ask me specifically uh, how many PowerPoint slides per minute is optimal. Yes? Uh, it preoccupies people. Uh, there is a syndrome of death by PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint is used all the time. I rather refer to visuals. I, when you're talking, uh, the audience might be looking at uh, a, a, an image uh, usually behind you. And how do you use that to manage people's attention? Um, I have a few things to say about this. PowerPoint is quite a powerful tool. Um, and um, most people start planning for a lecture by writing their PowerPoint. I would discourage people from doing this um, because what you tend to do if you do that is you put the content you want to uh, tell on the slides. You're using the slides as your ad memoir. Um, uh, they, they serve as lecture notes. Um, also, they double as what you have behind you and very often they're also used as handouts. Uh, I've had um, many times when I've asked to give uh, presentations in, in places and they email me and say, would you send your PowerPoint so we can give it as a handout in advance? Yes. So a handout is a different thing from the visuals behind you, which is a different thing from the memoir notes that you use to guide your uh, and make sure that you cover everything. Um, and often PowerPoint is used to fulfill all those three functions and it often doesn't fulfill any of them. So my advice is to uh, take PowerPoint as something behind you that needs to be designed to focus attention to the curricular points you're trying to make. I find visual aids helpful um, in drawing people's attention towards you. Um, if it's used in four ways. The first one is that a visual aid can function as a map. Um, you can chart the areas you're covering and show them how things are progressing and what's to come and what's already happened. So when people become distracted for a few seconds and they come back, they will look at your visuals and know how much you've moved in that map. The second useful way in which visuals can be used is to enhance the uh, mood of what you're saying. So use them as a way of evoking moods with images and that's uh, usually photography. Uh, so you can choose photographs that will uh, complement the content of what you're telling people and set the mood um, to, for, for people to listen to what you've got to say. And the third way is, of course, to present data. Um, so graphics and charts um, are, are very easily grasped visually uh, and, and complement what you're talking about. But you need to be careful not to make data presentation too complex. Otherwise, uh, people will spend the time uh, and the attention onto the slide rather than on what you are trying to say. And if that's what you've planned, that's OK. But you need to be careful about it. There is a balance to be struck between simplicity and complexity um, and uh, that is something you need to uh, make a good judgment about. If you put too much data or too complex, um, it, the, the flow of communication stops. If you make them too simple, um, uh, they seem redundant. Uh, I think people often uh, are on the side of making them too complex rather than too simple. Sometimes three or four words are enough. And the last bit about um, engaging audiences' attention is to realise that giving a lecture is more like telling a story. So what do I mean when I say that giving a lecture is like telling a story? Well, first of all, notice that um, when somebody gives you an anecdote, you're more likely to remember things. So, for instance, I told you the first few minutes are very important to set up the mood. Yes, and I can give you an anecdote 
uh, to make sure you remember that. For instance, I often go to lectures where the lecturer starts by saying, um, I'm sorry, I only had a few minutes to prepare this and the slides uh, were given to me yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. So, so that is the worst start to a lecture because although doing that makes the lecturer feel better, it's apologised, um, it also gives the message that uh, I don't know what I'm doing, haven't thought about this properly, and I'm not the right person to give this, and this is not that important. You've ruined the lecture by apologising, so remember, never apologise. Okay, so I've just given you this anecdote, and this anecdote hopefully will stay in your mind, and you will remember that the first few seconds of a lecture are very important, and that apologising doesn't work. Yes, uh, so giving little anecdotes to illustrate points is very important, so little stories. But what I'm trying to say is that the whole lecture should be approached as a story. And let me explain what I mean. The lecture usually starts with you giving them a reason why they should be here and why things are important, and then highlighting the points that are really important. This is almost like the start of a story when you introduce the characters and you set the characters against their background. In stories, storytellers tell you what's important and what's not important, what has value and what doesn't have value. And that's really the essence of a lecture, is to convey to people what is important and what is not. And I often treat my learning points almost as characters in a story that need to be introduced at the beginning. There needs to be some plot, something happens to them, there's some debate, some controversy in the middle, and then at the end there is an emotional payoff and uh, people do know all the characters and uh, people have a, a kind of emotional link to the, all those characters. So by the time you finish there is a sense of release and a sense of emotional completion. That's the arc of storytelling and that ha has to be in the structure of the lecture if you want the lecture to work and to be memorable. So an example of how this works is um, towards the end of the lecture, the last one minute or so, is the really important part of the lecture is what 90% of people are going to remember. Uh, that's when you need to uh, give the take-home messages that started your planning of the lecture. And you need to repeat them in a way that when people hear them, uh, they know those characters and they know their stories. For instance, um, uh, I'm going to end this bit of lecture by repeating the three characters that I introduced you at the very beginning, and hopefully when I do that, you will remember what's happened to those ideas through the lecture. Uh, that's the idea of the narrative arc towards the end. And also, very important that at the end, you don't introduce any new information. Yes, uh, Because if you do, you short circuit all that you've done before, because people have a sense that, that, that you didn't have time to get to the really important things. So a very common mistake is people uh, are halfway through their uh, lecture and they're told uh, you have one minute left uh, and their uh, uh, response is to compress what they had planned to deliver over 20 minutes in one minute. Yes, uh, you you waste that minute uh, because nothing that you compress that much is going to work at all. But you also lose the opportunity to use that minute for people to remember what you've already told them. Um, so the last 30 seconds, the last one minute is uh, as important as the first minute and it will determine what people will listen. So I'm entering now the last minute of this video and I'm going to follow my rules of um, uh, giving you the take home messages. So you might remember, I've told you three things. Uh, the first one is that less is more, that people overestimate how much they can fit in. The second one is that it's all about drawing attention to yourself and that you can do this with visuals, with interaction and using the first minute really well to set up the mood. And last bit is that you need to think of a lecture as a story. You need to have a beginning, a middle and an end. And at the end you need to say goodbye to the characters who are the most important things. So if that was a story, this is the after credit. The after credit is this is really not about how to record a lecture, this is about how to give a lecture live. I might do another video about how to record lectures, but I'm still learning.
Thank you.